Hey everyone, um, I'm sorry I had to set everything up for just a moment, um, and you know, Mac OS and Apple software. Um, so hey, I'm Christoph. I work at Facebook as a front-end engineer in the JavaScript infrastructure team, and today I'm going to tell you how we evolve our front-end code base, how it affects our open source projects, and I'll teach you how to do large-scale tool-assisted code changes to your JavaScript code effectively. And the word that we use for this at Facebook for tool-assisted code changes is code mods. It simply means code modifications, um, but we kind of invented it, and that's just how we call, uh, what we call it. And at Facebook, sometimes we use it interchangeably. Sometimes it's a manual change, and sometimes it's an automatic change. But it always refers to large-scale changes to a big portion of our code base. At Facebook, we have tens of thousands of JavaScript modules. And we need to make sure that the health of our code base um, is very good and that we have a good handle on that. But what's more is that we want to enable every engineer at Facebook to move fast, even with breaking changes. We often add new shiny abstractions, new language features, because it's always easy to add something new. And then we tell people, use that. It's awesome. Use let and const. Don't use var anymore. But we never go back and tell t people, hey, um, we need to clean this up. Can you deprecate your code, and can you remove it? And it's always really hard to get rid of deprecated code, especially if you have thousands of callers, callers um, around your code base. Browsers also gain new capabilities. Frameworks gain uh, new features as well. Uh, and we need to somehow handle this. Everything just becomes more complex. The problem is that even though we add all those new features, our health of our code base more and more declines because we have multiple ways of doing the same thing. We also want to encourage people to always just write code using the new patterns. But especially if you're new at a company or new at a code base, and you just started looking at it, and you try to figure out how something is done, you usually look at how other people around you did that same thing. And then you discover that all that code, um, you don't know if it's deprecated or not, but you use that code around you. Um, and then you write it as if it was like the latest and greatest thing. But you just use, like, write more and more deprecated code, even though you shouldn't be using those patterns anymore. And at Facebook, we often have hundreds or thousands of callers of something. So we actually have a web UI that allows you to search quickly across all of our code. And um, I had to make a change. And I was looking at, oh, how many like, lines of code and how many uh, invalid patterns are we using there um, that I have to update. And in this case, there were almost 100,000 results. And then it tells you, oh, I cannot display this to you because it was cra would crash your browser. So going through every call set manually is not a solution. It's not even an option for us in some cases. This is a code mod that I actually ran on our code base. We have a tool called CodeMod, and it's a regex-based code mod tool. Um, it's re very simple. It's an internal tool, but basically you say, I have this regex or this string, and I want to replace it with this other thing. And don't get me wrong, this has served us really well to evolve our code base over time. It's really good when you just do a, like, a simple rename. Um, you rename JSConf US to JSConf EU or something, and then you upload the website, and you're done. You know. Um, but we're way beyond simple renames. And also, the syntax for JavaScript becomes more and more complex and also ambiguous. So we can't really use regex anymore. So this is something I actually ran. Our URI class at Facebook um, is a little bit clowny. It has been around for a long time. But we used an early draft of ES2015 classes. So ES6, ECMAScript 6 was just finalized. It's now called ES2015. So I'm hopefully going to say ES2015. If I say ES6, then I'll buy you a beer later. Um, <laughs> So I, I haven't done regex code mods in a, in a long time, and I figured I can do this with a regex. The problem I tried to solve here was to add a new call to create an instance of the URI class instead of calling it as a function. And we had both patterns for the same class, because we just had this code that allowed to create a, an instance of this class with new and without new. And I figured, OK, I can do this with a, with a regex. It's pretty easy, right? So I wrote one regex, didn't catch all the cases. I wrote another regex, didn't catch all the cases either. I wrote a few more, and then at some point I was in this mess. And for some reason, everything was broken, because one of my regexes wasn't very good. I probably had a star or a dot or a question mark or something. Um, and I was just really frustrated. And then I rewrote this using an AST-based code mod, and it was done in two minutes. And it is basically two lines of code. So I mentioned ASTs. Code mods that operate on the AST, that's the abstract syntax tree representation of JavaScript, instead of the source text representation, um, they can really help us here make a difference. 
If you build a strong code mod for an API change you're making, you can revert and apply it every time you make a change to the code that you're trying to, um, to build. And what about rebasing? When you manually update your code on a long-lived branch when you're working on a new feature or something, you have to redo changes potentially every time when you pull from master or something like that. With AST code mods, I can just rerun them before I actually push my change. Done. But I also want to talk about the frustration and the desperation that one often feels when they're thinking of making a breaking uh, API change. Good code mods are really hard. And I'm sure every one of you at least once decided not to run a code mod because it seemed too difficult. And they just kept the old API around. They didn't, didn't make a breaking change because it just wasn't, you didn't have the right tooling for that. However, quite often, there's simply no other way around code mods. We can't just rewrite our entire code base because we have a couple of bad abstract abstractions. We must find ways to evolve our uh, code base, um, our code base incrementally, or well, change complex systems incre incrementally, with a clearly envisioned end state in mind. At Facebook, we hack everything, and I put up these posters around the product infrastructure team, and someone just took this and made their own version of it. Um, I actually like this better than the original title. But we also need to be confident when we make these large uh, uh, changes to the code base. There's no point in running a code mod if it disrupts every single engineer at your whole company. The whole point of this is not to break anything and to enable every engineer to move faster. And code mod tools help us do this. And the tool that we built at Facebook is called JS Code Shift. It was built by Felix Kling from the UI info team at Facebook. And he built it more than a year ago, and then he kept it secret for a really, really long time. And he was sitting next to me at the time at Facebook, and we casually like, talked about this new API that I wanted to build, and I had this idea of what I wanted to build, and I just didn't know how to get there. It was impossible to do. And then he was like, oh, yeah, so I built this tool. It's probably not very good. And I was like, OK, let's take a look at this. And I looked at it, and I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. We've got to open source this. And then we did. Um, and this is really cool. So let's dive into how I got started with um, this kind of uh, code mod work. And it's really exciting to be finally able to talk about how we built a Relay framework. I don't know if you've heard about Relay, but it's a data framework on top of the React framework. And early this year, right after we announced it at ReactJSConf, we wanted to build this new API. Uh, we wanted to move away from this mixin called React GraphQL.mixin to um, an implicit higher order component um, that is called relay.createContainer that creates that. Um, so in Relay, we, use, we used to have this mixin, but it used internal React APIs. We couldn't have shipped to open source with that. And it was breaking all the time because React changed all the time as well. Um, and we also couldn't, because we were using a mixin, we weren't able to support ES 2015 class uh, React components. And it was also just a way cleaner implementation. So we really wanted to, to move to this. But the problem is, this completely changed the full public API of Relay. And admittedly, it's not a big public, a public API, but it changed the entire API. And at that point in time, early this year, there were already hundreds of files using, uh, written using Relay. And the product teams building Relay products were moving really fast. Building this new API took about a month to complete. And I, had to run, uh, I built a code mod, and I had to run it at least 10 to 15 times to test different stages of this new API. If I had done this manually while we were building this new API for a month, I would have had to change those hundreds of files manually every time when some product developer changed something, and it would be, uh, it would be a huge mess. It's painful. Just to get a better idea, of, um, here's the before and after. It doesn't matter if you know Relay or React. It just matters that you have pattern matching capabilities in your brain, and you just compare those two code pieces side by side. The left side is before, and the right side is after. So if you've ever removed a mixin from a React component and made a higher order component yourself, you probably know what the challenges are that are involved here. But in this case, so the original example, oh, I guess this laser pointer thing doesn't really work that well here. Um, we had a mixin up there, and we had statics. And the new version didn't have this mixin anymore. And then um, we had on line 15 this uh, relay.create container call that wasn't there before. And then also we moved the statics into the second ar argument to this function call. 
And traditionally, we would, we would solve this with regex, right? And a lot of you probably think, OK, this doesn't seem that difficult. I can probably do this with a regex. Um, I could maybe do it, but I wouldn't be confident, and I'm sure it would break badly. And here's why. I could probably build a regex for the example from before, which is on the left again. But now look at the variation of a similar module, which is on the right. It's just a different developer built a similar module um, with a different code convention. So this one actually had a second mix in, so we can't just remove that whole mix in line. It also had different statics, and it's different in how it was exported. All that kind of stuff is different. But also, for this change, I had to add a new module that didn't exist before and remove an old one from the require block. And at Facebook, we have human code conventions, as everyone probably does, where I had to insert that new require statement at the right alphabetical location. This is just a lot of work with regex, you know? So this is just what I wanted to show you, what can be different from one module to another module. And quite often, that might be two people working on the same team, working on the same product. You know? And the whole point of this is to output some code that looks like a human had written this. You know? So I need to figure out, how can I write a code mod that looks like I wrote this code? But there's more. What does this piece of JavaScript mean? Does anyone know? Anyone seen this before? Everyone's quiet. So we don't actually know, because it depends on what context this is used in. So this is an entirely different piece of JavaScript. Anyone, anyone has an idea? Everyone's shaking their head. So the first one, this is actually a, a block statement with a label called JavaScript. And the, va um, the value that it maps to is um, a binary expression is awesome, and then concatenates that together. But the second one, this is actually an object expression where the key is JavaScript. It only has one property, and the value is, is awesome. You'll see a little bit more later. All right, I've talked about why code modes are important and why regex is not going to help us. So what is JS CodeShift? What does it do for us? Simple description is that it's an AST to AST based code mode tool. But that doesn't really help us. We need to dig a little bit deeper and figure out what um, what tools are involved, and what concepts do we need to understand. So let's ask ourselves, what do we actually want to do here? We want to take one piece of JavaScript and output a different piece of JavaScript. And we're going to operate on the AST. So we need to parse, an a, uh, parse, parse JavaScript uh, source code into an AST. Then we need to find the nodes that we want to replace, create new nodes that we want to insert, then update the AST at the right location, and then print it back into JavaScript source, ideally with proper formatting, and it should look like a human wrote this. I want to point out here that all that we do here is simple tree operations. As front-end developers, you should all know what this is uh, doing, right? We're, do we're dealing with the DOM all the time. We find, create, and update nodes. It's the same for ASCs. So let's look at each of these step by step. So first off, parse. I talked about the abstract syntax tree. A lot of people mentioned it, but I'm pretty sure a lot of you are like, nope. Sounds like static analysis. Not going to deal with this. This is annoying. But it doesn't matter if you know ASTs or you don't. I'm going to show you how or what an AST looks like in just a minute, and you can time me if you want to. There's a tool that we built at Facebook um, called AST Explorer. And I'm going to do a quick demo if I can figure out how to switch to the demo. All right. Cool, I'm at the demo. This is not very big. This is better. All right, cool. So this is the AST Explorer. You can follow along if you have your, com your laptop open. And all that this does is, is it gives you two panels. On the left side, there's the code that you can write. On the right side, uh, there's the AST representation of that same code. And an AST, don't be scared. It's just a simple JSON data structure. And this tool really helps um, visualizing what you're dealing with. So in this sample code, we have two um, statements, um, one of them is a variable declaration, and one of them is a function declaration. It's not very exciting. There's just a variable dec declarator in here. Um, it's initialized using an array expression. And it's called tips, and that's an identifier. So let's look at some other code. So I showed you this example before, right? And you were like shaking your head, and you're like, what are you talking about? This doesn't make sense. This looks like an object. But no, actually, this is a block statement. And then it has a label here. The label is called JavaScript. And then the body of this uh, block statement is a binary expression. OK, so now let's wrap it in parentheses. And now suddenly, this is an object expression. It has one property. And then this property has a key that's an identifier called name, and then a value with a binary expression um, that is awesome expression. All right, cool. 
Um, remember what an object expression looks like. I'll go over this in a moment, but this is important. Um, we also can do function calls, a little bit of German here. Um, so in this case, this is also important. Um, there's a call expression. The callee is called Haro, and the arguments um, is a string literal called JSCon. All right. And then let's do something quick. We can create a class, JSCon for you. Has awesome food. Does it have, has awesome, have awesome food? Yes, hell yeah. And then we can also say this ex probably extends JSConf. All right. And then we can see here this is a class decoration. Its ID, its name is JSConf EU. It has a super class that it extends. And then here it has a class body. And it has a method called has awesome food. And of course, this some, somewhere returns true. All right, so that's an AST. So next, I want to talk about create. We're going to skip over find. I hope that's OK. I hope you'll allow me to do this. Um, I said before that we're dealing with a simple object data structure, so we could probably just build up an object and put it anywhere in the, into our AST. And that works fine. You can do that if you want. But then you don't really have any type guarantees, and you probably end up in a mess because you sometimes make a typo, and then nothing works anymore. But there's a project created by Benjamin, Benjamin Newman, who used to work at Facebook, called AST types. It also has a very similar syntax to Babel's type um, creation system. And what this gives us is an API to define AST types, and then it gives us a, a functional API to compose those AST nodes. And it gives you type safety, and it tells you when you cannot like, create an AST node with the types that you have uh, in mind. So I'm just going to go quickly over this example. You already saw the object expression before. But here um, on the left side, we define an object expression. It's based on an expression. It's built up using properties, and the field properties is um, is an array of uh, property. And you can see property right below that. Uh, property is based on a node. It's built up using the kind, the key, and the value. The kind is either it's init, a getter, or a setter. Usually it's init because we don't, we're scared of getters and setters. Um, and then there's a, a key that is either a string literal or an identifier. And then there's a field value, which can be any expression. And as you can see here already, because the value can be any expression, it can also be an object expression, because an object expression um, is based on an expression. And then on the right-hand side, you can see um, an uh, how we built this up. And basically, we get a function called object expression. We pass in a property. And it would, if we were to print that code, it would print JavaScript is awesome. Of course, depending on the context, it would add parentheses, because otherwise it would be a label statement, and we don't know what to do. There's more. In JS CodeShift, you can actually type out your JavaScript code in a template literal, and then we parse that JS code, and then you can actually, we're using substitution to, to output proper um, AST nodes. And then this is from an example that converts for loops into a while loop. This is really cool. All right. I'm going to skip over update. I hope you'll allow me to do that, too. But we're, we talked about parse and create, and now let's talk about printing. This is really hard. The project we're using for this is Recast. It was also created by Ben Newman, and it's really awesome. It gives us one API. That's all we need. It's called recast.print. Why is this important, or what's the point of this? How do we get that AST back into JavaScript that has the same formatting that the code had before? This is what Recast does. If you build a JS compiler like Babel, you don't really care about the output of your, uh, of your transform transformed code, right? Because the only thing that sees your output is the browser, and not even that because we usually minify code. But if you write a code mode, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where suddenly the code that you've printed that you didn't even touch looks completely different from before. If I do this, if I run a code mod, and I only change like one like, tiny little thing here, and then the output looks completely different, and I run it on tens of thousands of JavaScript modules, every engineer at the company is going to be annoyed by me. I don't want that. I don't want any engineer to know that I'm even doing this. So Recast provides a pretty printer. So you can provide it options on what your code style is, but it also tries to infer some of the rules that, are, that you're using in your code, like indentation. But what's even better is that it doesn't even try to reprint the code that you didn't touch. And that is important, because that way you're only changing the things you're actually changing. And this is why we cannot just use Babel, which is a compiler, to do this for us. Not yet anyway. Stay tuned. Uh, hopefully we can build this. 
So we've talked about parsing an AST, creating AST nodes, and how we then print the AST back into source code. Now, for find and update, this is finally where JS CodeShift ties everything together. It provides this neat little package for you to do these um, AST code mods. And in the past, we simply didn't have tools that enable to do this. We didn't even have a standard for JS ASTs a couple years ago, right? So we needed all these tools to be there before that. So let's do a demo, right? Everyone loves demos. In this demo, we will write a transform that gets rid of a hypothetical module called Merge. And this is a module that actually existed in three different variations at Facebook. And then I killed them all at Facebook. Um, they're not there anymore. You can search the source code. It's not there, I promise. The merge module took all the arguments that you passed into it. It created a new object and merged all the properties from the passed in objects into that new object, gave you that new object. Pr quite simple, right? But then we created this new syntax, mainly for React in the beginning, but then we realized this is also really awesome for objects. We can use the spread property, those are the three dots right there that you see in the second line, to spread all the properties of an object into a new object. And this is a really powerful syntax. This is not a standard yet, but we hope it will be in ES 27, uh, 2016 or 2017. So we're, we are transforming what you see in the first line to what you see in the second line. Ironically, because it's not actually a standard, we are using Babel to transform it into the third line for the browser. Um, so this is actually really funny. But given that those merge calls, they could be nested, and there could be nested merge calls and really deep object structures. And you could even have like whole functions in those merge calls. Like we had like a module that um, pulled in another module and then merged new functions onto that module. This is impossible to deal with in regex, right? It just cannot be done. And how do you format the output, right? If we don't have recast, we don't even know how to format what we're doing here. So I ran this code mod at FB. It was no big deal. I got rid of about 1,000 callers of this function and about 4,000 callers of the other two modules. Um, no one noticed. I had to actually tell people afterwards. But it's gone, and everyone's using just one thing to do the same thing, and it's hopefully going to be, uh, become a JavaScript standard. All right, demo time again. This is really fun. Let me find the computer. All right, I already populated this. So. We looked at the call expression before. I'm just going to show it to you again really quickly. So we have a call expression here. And it has three properties somewhere here, arguments, sorry. And then it has an identifier, an object expression, and an identifier. I'm just going to show you what the output is going to look like. We need the parentheses, of course, as I showed you before. So it's going to be something like A. And then what I want is I want object expressions to be inlined. All right, oops, sorry. So let's look at this. It's an object expression, and it has three properties. Two of them are spread properties, and one of them is a property. All right. So we built this AST Explorer, and then we were like, OK, can we put JS Code Shift into this? And then we did. Let me just use this a little bit. So we got this live coding environment here. It's really cool. So the JS Code Shift API um, is basically you, you create a file and it exports a function that you can then apply using a runner that runs um, in, uh, concurrently across your entire code base. And it gives you the file, the source of the file, and the API of JS Code Shift. Here on line five, I'm just mapping it to J. Um, J does everything for us, um, and we'll be writing it quite often, so that's why it's a short one character identifier. And then we just pass this thing into J, and it gives us this really cool object that's really magical. You should read the documentation. Um, not very important right now. But what we're doing here, this is the standard transform. We just find all the identifiers, and then we update them. And what we do is we just re re reverse the identifier. This is not a useful transform unless you wrote your code originally left to right, or right to left, sorry. <laughs> anyway, the cool thing is um, we can live code here. So if you're feeling German, you can uppercase all your code. And then it will still work, which is awesome. But that's not very useful for us. So we realized um, up there we need to operate on call expressions. So this is a call expression. And then it doesn't work. It's just the name is actually callie.name. But now it got rid of all the important stuff. And now there's only merge. We don't really want that. So what we want to replace it with is an object expression. That's what we saw before. And that we noticed that that takes an array. All right, so that's cool. It doesn't really do a lot, but we replace all the merge calls with um, object expression. The problem is 
this is not merge, and it's also replaced. We don't want that. So this gives us the ability to actually um, do pattern matching here. Right, so now we're only actually updating all the merge calls. And then here, what we can do is we map over all the arguments. So we have the DAST node here. And then we have the argument. And then we just return a spread property with the argument. And boom, we're done. Let me just format this. Uh, whatever. OK, but this is not what we wanted, right? We wanted to inline those objects. So let's just look for the type here, object expression, and then return all the properties of this argument instead. All right, this doesn't work. Um, we actually need to use this really awesome short version of ES26, uh, 2015 code with a recursive flatten implementation. And boom. Now you can see that we successfully replaced that merge module. So this was actually just five lines of code. All right. And to me, this was like learning a superpower. And what's awesome is when you learn how to do this, you can just write Babel plugins. If you realize your code mode is not actually code mode, it's a transform that optimizes a pattern, you can just write a Babel plugin. So one more thing. JavaScript now has a class creation mechanism that we're supporting in React. I figured we could transform React.create class calls to ES2015 classes with a code mod. Isn't that fun? You know, I built a code mod, can automatically do this. If you look at this example, it um, removes get initial state, inlines it into this new constructor. It removes the this axis and props because it's now a local variable. It does a lot of stuff. Um, it also adds the prop types later on. But I talked a little bit about this. We did a demo on just like a tiny little sample code. That's not really fun, you know. So I found this project on GitHub that's like material UI for React. Now let's run this thing. It takes a little while. It skips over all the mix-ins because we don't really have a good solution for that. But you can build your own code mod to get rid of your own mix-ins if you use them a lot. So this runs a little bit. It takes a little while. Um, I tested it yesterday, so I'm 200% sure that this works really well. And now, OK, we're done. It used all the cores of my MacBook. And then it transformed 845 files. Let's look at this. Yeah, it looks about right. All right. Can we send a pull request? I don't have internet. Do I have internet? Oh, I should probably push it. All right. Where is it? Button is not working. Oh, here it is. All right. <laughs> there it is. This was fun. <laughs> it was 845 lines of code, uh, 845 files, and probably five to 10,000 lines of code. If anyone asks, I didn't touch that code. I just wrote the JavaScript that wrote this JavaScript. So my favorite uh, editor is JavaScript. But sometimes you cannot fix something automatically. Just not possible. We don't really have the static analysis tools yet. What I found at Facebook is that you can bribe people really well with t-shirts. So at Facebook, we have been using an early draft of ES2015 uh, classes for two and a half years. It allowed every engineer in the company to move way faster every day than they could have using ES5 um, um, features. You have to consider that a lot of engineers at Facebook didn't grow up, grow up with JavaScript in their heart like all of us here did. You know? The problem with our implementation of classes was that we didn't require super to be called um, in a child class, something that is required in ES 2015. We had about 1,000 invalid callers. 
How did I detect them? Oh, I wrote a code mod script that was just going through all the code and did static analysis to find out which ones were wrong. We were able to fix about 600 of them automatically because they didn't have any interesting parent constructors. But then 400 of them we had to fix manually. So we do hackathons at Facebook. I promised everyone a t-shirt. Um, we got 20 people together. We had 400 invalid call sites, so that's about 20 call sites per person, if my math doesn't fail me. Um, and we did it. Everyone got a t-shirt. We high-fived each other. It was great. But the whole point of this is that I want to point out that code mods are not a silver bullet. They're not going to solve all your problems, but most of the times they're really useful. And they assist you when you do manual cleanups. So what's the impact on open source that I mentioned earlier? It's important to understand how we approach open source at Facebook. We only open source what we use in production and at scale. Library authors, like the React team, they are responsible for deploying new versions of React internally on every repository, and they are um, responsible for making sure that we move to new APIs as fast as possible, and they're making sure that we move fast even with breaking changes. But we always use master. If master is broken, Facebook is broken. So this should explain why we have invested in this kind of code mode tooling. We have a lot of React code. But the tooling has actually influenced how we approach uh, open source code. If you have looked at recent release notes of React Native or React, you see that we actually published code mods. So for React and the React DOM split up in 0.14, you can run a script if you have a large code base, and it will be fixed automatically for you. This is great. When we make breaking changes and we can write you a script that upgrades your code automatically when you update your new version of React, the whole community wins. And people have been really happy with this. This person found this tool, and in less than two hours, he safely transformed thousands of lines of code. This was outside of Facebook. It's really cool. What I found about this is that I recently ran a code mod on, on every um, test file at Facebook. And a day later, after I had already made all those changes, I wanted to figure out how many lines of code did I actually change. And it was 40,000 lines of code. I didn't even notice that when I was doing the change. And there were no problems. All the tests are still running. Everything's great. Um, there's just one more th tiny little thing. I'm sorry. We're a little bit over because it took me a moment to set everything up. Dan Abramov from the React community was asking for an online bubble editor. And then I was like, didn't I already just show you like basically the same thing with uh, JS Code Shift? So do you want to see that really quick? All right. This only takes 10 seconds, I promise. Whoops. So here, we just go into bubble. And then what we're going to do, we're just going to translate our JavaScript to German, because that's fun. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for Stuhan. <laughs> <laughs>